Alrighty, everybody, time to gather our thoughts and plant our feet. So far, we've only done a very, very few basic things here. So it might seem like we've only just barely left the beach, but the reality is if we turn around, we realize we're actually in very deep waters already, and we are very far from the beach. Let's consider the current situation. We actually already have a lot of variables, and these are gonna need to be accounted for. Not only do we have explicit variables, right? We actually have these implicit ones as well. So our explicit variables are um, percent change as pattern recognition. So how are we actually recognizing patterns? Well, we've used percent change. Uh, and this could be obviously other things. We could use a logarithm to do something like this. And there's a whole lot of other things that we could do to recognize patterns. We've just happened to have chosen percent change for its simplicity. Now, next, number two, to dive deeper into that percent change, we've done start point to end point percent change as compared to point by point or end to start percent change, right? So point by point could possibly give us look different looking patterns, but the lines themselves would be closer together, in theory, anyways. Uh, and then uh, an end to beginning percent change would give us kind of the opposite of what we have here, right? So if you look here, uh, we've got very close starting points. But as we get to the very end, we have very wide. I mean, it's almost probably three times as, as variable as the beginning. So if we were to reverse this, in theory, it would be reversed. And therefore, the end of the pattern would be more similar. And it could be argued that it was more likely for the end to continue you know, to be more predictive or accurate in its prediction than in this format. But in my, at least in my opinion, theoretically, I would argue that really they're the same pattern. The only difference is this one has been, this one's reacting quicker, right? So I don't really think it makes a huge difference. But anyway, it is something on the table. Number three, we're using a fixed pattern length of 30 uh, pieces of, of data. That could be, we could do 31, we could do 20, we could do, 30,000, we, you know what I'm saying? Like we could do any number, right? And probably a good number would be anything between 10 and 1,000, really, since we are doing tick data here. So keep that in mind. So pattern length. Next, <laughs> um, we're using a fixed value or, or weight of these patterns, no matter how old or fresh these patterns are. So if we're getting this pattern, we're comparing it to a pattern that we actually found. I mean, in this case, we're only using one day's worth of data. But in most cases, you would probably looking be looking at years worth of data. And you would want to be comparing uh, your current data or your current pattern to years worth of patterns. But would you value a pattern from two years ago the same as you would value a pattern from like a week ago? You know, probably not, but maybe. But it is something to put on the table. And right now we're valuing them exactly the same. Five, we are looking 20 to 30 points in the future to decide on the outcome. We're just averaging the outcome from 20 to 30 points in the future. Basically enough time to ex have executed a trade and held it for a few seconds and then maybe sold that trade. So is this you know, 20 to 30 points in the future truthful? Should we make it a wider range? Should we make it further in the future, shorter in the future? All those things um, could be switched up. The next thing we have is similarity required for the patterns to be a quote unquote match. As I showed you, um, you have a huge difference between 70% accuracy required and 75% accuracy required. And number six is quite possibly one of the worst variables to have because we could require not only you know, 71, 72, 73, we could require 71.12345678910. You could have a million decimals. You could have a trillion decimals, right? So in this sense, uh, number six is an, un there is an, in it's, oh, I can't even say it, an infinite number of possibilities for the number six. So that one's the hardest one, but luckily there is an answer for machine learning. But moving on, we have an implicit variable that I haven't really talked about too much yet. But that variable is opportunity versus accuracy. So 
usually in machine learning to typically find the best scenario that we can, especially in the case where we might have an, literally an infinite number of scenarios. Um, it's much like how a company finds the best price for their product. So profit margin matters, but the amount sold matters as well, right? So a very cheap price is going to sell a bunch of units, presumably. But, a, but profit per unit sold will be much less than if we had a higher price per unit. But that higher price per unit would result in fewer sales. So you've got to make this nice balance, right? You've got a way opportunity um, here, which would be you know, the volume of possible trades, much like the amount of units sold, compared to the accuracy, which is how often we're actually correct with our prediction, um, which is more like profit margin. Since you might, you know, even though that might not sound like profit margin, but since you might have, let's say, a 60% accuracy in a very high volume of opportunities compared to 80% accuracy in low volume, so then you've got a percentage profit margin. So consider, consider the following. If you found an algorithm that will earn you $2 a trade and it is 85% accurate, very appealing. With this, you're allotted an opportunity to deploy this tactic 600 times for 600 trades. So that means you're going to, uh, at 85%, uh, you'd be successful with 510 of those trades. You would also lose 90 of them. So 510 successful trades at $2 a trade is $1,000 and $1,020. Sorry, Skype. Anyway, 90 unsuccessful trades at $2 a trade means you've lost $180. So your total profit in this scenario is $840. Let's consider another situation. You still earn $2 a trade if successful, but we actually, we've dropped. We're only 70% accurate. That said, with that 70% accuracy, it's a loser algorithm and gives you way more opportunity. You get 1,800 trades this time. So this means out of 1,800 trades at 70% accuracy, you get 1,260 successful trades for $2,520 in profit. This also means 540 trades are not profitable, so you, uh, you lose $1,080. But your total profit in the end is $1,440. Now compared to the old $840, that's much better. So the above example, even though it might sound like, well, that was a lot more trades for you know, such a small movement in accuracy, that wasn't really an under-exaggeration. So you just saw in the previous video how big of a change the move from 70 to 75 made. If we move from 70 to 85, I could show you, but we're, it's going to be, we probably won't even get, we would, this, this chart probably won't even show up, right? So, so that's, um, it is, as, there's probably an under-exaggeration as far as opportunity change. Also, you lose comparable patterns. The patterns that are actually very comparable, um, you lose them. So not only do you lose opportunity, I think you're, you're sacrificing accuracy as well at the same time. Now, that's a huge wrench to throw into the, the equation because obviously we have an infinite number of variables, right? Because again, we could look, we could require something like 72.55225125551 accuracy, right? You, it's just unlimited. Um, and you could quickly find that you've got like an unlimited number of variables times another unlimited number of variables times another unlimited. So where do you even start, right? So the accepted method when it comes to machine learning and, and you know navigating your way through infinity is you continue adjusting in the same direction variables that are producing an increasing uh, performance. So as you tinker with a variable, if performance is going up exponentially, you continue your tinkering with that variable. Okay, so. Um, so that's how you do it, and then you would continue tinkering until performance drops, right? And then you know you've found a, a decent balance point. That said, <laughs> uh, as time goes on, it's very likely for all these variables to change, <laughs> right? So as, as volatility might change, or the overall economy, whatever, um, you're going to notice that the variables themselves uh, and the perfect balance is also changing. So that's what, what machine learning is for. And uh, this is kind of the downside to the idea of a neural network, which is most closely what we're doing here. And that's that it, you know, the, if you do a neural network, a huge neural network is the most accurate of, of probably even support vector machines. 
But until you can do the computation of that huge neural network, it's not uh, the best method. But um, here, at least for our, our needs so far, everything that we've done, even though Python is slow, um, it can be done in like C with a decent uh, computer. But we'll, we will talk on, on that a little bit more in depth in a future video. Anyway, definitely a required video. I realize we didn't do any, any programming. But you have to be made aware of, of where we stand at the moment as far as um, you know what we're what we're doing and what this means, what the implications of what we're doing are, and all of the variables that are coming into play already. That a few of which have un, unlimited um, variance to them. So uh, with that, I'm going to conclude uh, video 13, and in 14 we will continue back on uh, with programming and having a lot more fun and creating even more variables. So anyways, uh, as always, thanks for watching, thanks for the support and the subscriptions, and until next time.